Welcome, everyone, this evening. Um, for those of you who don't know me, I'm David Friedberg. I'm the director of the Italian Academy. And it's my great honor to welcome to the Academy this evening Vittorio Galese, who is going to talk to us about the subject which I've heard Vittorio speak many times, but I have never heard him talk on this particular subject, which I'm going to say now, so that, and you'll see it again, but that you have it fixed in your head, on the first person experiential dimension, oops, excuse me, body, self, and interpersonal relations in schizophrenia. I was reading the exegesis. Yep. So, a body, self, and interpersonal relations in schizophrenia. That's all you need to know for the moment. Vittorio will explain the rest. So, Vittorio Galese is one of the greatest cognitive neuroscientists. Everyone knows him. I hope he'll allow me to say that while everybody knows him for a number of things, they know him above all for his central role in the discovery of mirror neurons and the flood of publications that began with it in the mid-1990s and never stopped. With this discovery, he and his colleagues made what is, in my view, one of the greatest discoveries ever in the relationship between movement and emotion. Not an entirely new topic, but always unresolved. Not only between movement and emotional expression, but also between movement and the emotional understanding of others, or the understanding of the emotions of others. This means that one, uh, this leads to one of the greatest discoveries ever, in short, of how we understand the movements, gestures, intentions, and feelings of others, of all races and peoples across the globe. Critical importance for how we relate to all other people. In doing so, Vittorio and his colleagues opened up our entire understanding of the meaning and implications of imitation in humans, of imitative feelings and imitative actions. The feelings we have in, within ourselves of how other people are feeling and how other people are acting, and also the imitative actions. You know, I like to think as a, um, a person who goes to museums rather frequently, most of you here go to museums a lot anyway, and I've always been interested in those feelings we have when somebody make a gesture like this on a canvas or even attempt to attack someone of how we have a sense within ourselves of performing that same action. In fact, as you know, guards are very afraid that you will actually perform those actions. So in doing so, um, the, uh, in doing so, the, he and his team transformed the ways in which we understand a vast range of behavioral responses to others. Vittorio was the leader of the group that moved on from the initial discovery of mirror neurons to study the implications of these discoveries for language, for music, for touch and hearing, in fact, for all the other senses. He opened up the growing field of enactivism. He coined the now fundamental term of embodied simulation, which has so helped us understand basic forms of social communication and human creativity. He has transformed our understanding of the intentions of others, of our responses to their joys, sorrows, distress, and, of course, to the sight of injuries to the bodies of others. Alas, more relevant than ever as we open our newspapers and watch what happens on the television. No one has made a greater contribution to the way we think, not just about motor responses, but about multisensorial responses in general. The transformation of visual responses into haptic sensations, for example. When we go again, to continue the museological parallel, when we go into museum and we look at a furry surface, we have a sense in our fingers, in the, our bodies, of that furry quality that some people so excellently convey. We even may imagine the mere hints of possible haptic sensations. And he's thereby given renewed energies to the older and often purely intuitive works on all these subjects. In short, Vittorio has an unparalleled knowledge of and insight into the relationship between our sensory motor system and cognition both in non-human primates and in humans. In addition to all of this, he has worked on how the brain represents space on action understanding, like reaching, oops, like reaching to grasp. See, it's central to all our activities, whether we actually act or whether we think we're acting. He swiftly saw the relevance of mirror neurons for the neurobiological understanding of intersubjectivity, of empathy, 
aesthetics and theory of mind. And speaking of theory of mind, we also saw early on the implications for autism and schizophrenia about which we are happy and proud he will speak today. But you are probably mostly already fans of Vittorio, and so you know most of this. You know it all by now. But I remind you that he's also an MD and a neurologist. He's professor of psychobiology and cognitive neuroscience in the Department of Medicine and Surgery at the University of Parma. He's the, uh, I, actually I should have mentioned, because as you all gather, this is a real virtuoso in the 17th century sense. He's a member of the Club del... 27. 27. I just wanted the club of 27, yeah. which celebrates the operas of Verdi um, above all. So as you can, you'll soon hear, he has a great voice, if you haven't heard him speak already. Please, David. <laughs> I'm not going Don't. to ask you to sing. <laughs> Don't. <laughs> Ma già parlando, Don't certainly <clears throat> speaking, you have a good voice. So. Um, I'm proud to say that both he and his distinguished wife, Alessandra Umilta, are adjunct senior research scholars of our department at um, at Columbia, um, and um, we are really happy that he's able to use the resources of Columbia and has done so for many years. And we're happy to have him with us in my Department of Art History as well. He's fellow of the Institute of Philosophy at the University of London and of any number of other academies um, and, and <coughs> clubs and, uh, and um, honorary lecturer at a thousand universities across the globe. But I'd better stop this listing now, or we'd be here all the evening. He's written three books about the aesthetic and psychological implications of mirror neurons and embodied simulation, including a brilliant one on neuroscience in the cinema, which he called the empathic screen. And I think one of the things which Vittorio certainly has not got enough credit for has been the extraordinary rise of interest in the phenomenon of empathy, so often vulgarized now and banalized now, um, but without the discovery of mirror neurons, we would know much, much less about empathy than we do at the moment, however we choose to define it, a controversial topic, but it really started there. Um, so, um, there are over 300 articles by him as well, and every one of them which I've read has been a gripping read. I'm serious. You read them too, and you'll feel compelled to engage with his work, even if you disagree. But Vittorio, you know, 300 articles, big books, all these public appearances may suggest that he is a machine, but he is no machine. He's not a nerd either, and is not in the slightest what Italians like to call a barone, of which we have many. Um, there are many, the barone who is the pompous professor who overrates his own authority. His humanity, al contrario, anzi, his humanity shines through at every step of the way. He's a model of courtesy and generosity. He's a wonderful person to collaborate with. I could have began by telling you of my first meeting with Vittorio in, in, in 2002, um, in which I was thrilled to meet him because I had been writing about movement and empathy and always been interested in emotions, and at that time he was a demigod, um, as he still is in a way, but we won't we would let this go to his head too much. His general knowledge is immense, and yet at the same time is always ready to listen and learn from others. He's been one of the most wonderful and open fellows at the Academy. We couldn't want more, and we're truly proud to have you with us here this evening and this year, in fact. I ask you all to join me in welcoming Vittorio Gallo. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, David, for this too generous introduction. Welcome to everyone. Thank you for coming this uh, afternoon. Uh, um, and uh, thank you to the Italian Academy for Advanced Studies in America and to Columbia University for this wonderful opportunity of uh, work and research uh, at Columbia. Um, today I'm going to talk, um, to discuss some of the results from our lab uh, and from other colleagues uh, in the last 15 years or so on a topic that kept me busy uh, um, uh, for a long time, namely the relationship between the brain, the body, and mental health. And uh, today I will uh, cover an important aspect of uh, uh, this research of ours, 
dealing with psychosis, with uh, schizophrenia. I'm a Mac user, and so I'm a bit, uh, okay, okay, we got it, okay, there you go. I would like to start with this um, quote from this wonderful little book written by Siri Hustvet, uh, who uh, most of you probably will know as uh, another writer and an essayist, uh, um, really uh, a bright mind. And in this uh, small book about her experience with this uh, shaking behavior, which truly is a, is a marvelous synthesis of uh, neuroscience, neuropsychology, psychoanalysis, and psychiatry. Uh, she um, wrote this statement, which I think is a very nice overture uh, uh, to my talk. Uh, begin quote, medical history changes, and many, if not most doctors, have little grasp of what came before their own contemporary frames for diagnosis. In relation to the topic of schizophrenia, I think it's particularly interesting and fruitful to look back at this uh, uh, history, uh, which is more than 100 years old. And uh, uh, we may wish to uh, see starting uh, with the publication, for example, of the Handbook of Psychopathology by Carl Jasper in 1913. So it's more than uh, 100 years that uh, uh, people are busy in thinking about and theorizing and trying to uh, address this uh, uh, particularly uh, dramatic uh, uh, condition. So among uh, um, the many psychiatrists who, um, so to speak, uh, is Ernst Kreschmer, professor of uh, psychiatry, mostly at the University of Tübingen. He is mostly known for uh, a discredited theory that try to find uh, a correlation between uh, the complexion of the body and uh, the psychological type, the, the picnic, the leptosomic. Uh, uh, but he uh, made very interesting contributions uh, in relation to what I take to be totally neglected uh, uh, by contemporary psychiatry, uh, I mean the dimension, the dimensionality of uh, mental health and negatively speaking, if we want to uh, address mental health in this dichotomous uh, way, health on the one hand and disease on the, on the other hand, at the very least, uh, uh, the dimensionality of mental health uh, uh, I think is more helpful than a rigid uh, categorical uh, uh, approach like the one that we all know, that of DSM, who has uh, great merits but also a uh, uh, very strong uh, limitation. Nature is by nature, if you allow me the expression, dimensional. Categories are imposed by language, okay? Uh, another uh, uh, member of this uh, psychopathological tradition, European tradition, uh, very much influenced by phenomenology, is Ludwig Binswanger, who had a very complex and long relationship uh, with Abi Warburg in his clinic. Also, Binswanger underlines that psychosis, alienation, is not to be understood as a negativity with respect to the norm, but rather as a variation of the a priori transcendental ontological structure in which the existence of the subject reveals its mode of being. As usual, when we deal with phenomenological psychopathology, the language is never crystal clear. <laughs> it's rather convoluted, but I think the meaning is very clear. And this is a meaning which emphasizes the dimensional aspect uh, of mental health uh, as, uh, in my opinion, also 
very strong uh, ethical implication about the way we treat uh, uh, people that come to us uh, because of their mental condition. So, to summarize, this slide portrays my uh, total insatisfaction, which goes back uh, quite a long time, with the unique or main approach uh, to psychosis. In spite of the historically consolidated psychopathological perspective, neuroscientific research applied to schizophrenia has so far almost entirely neglected the first person experiential dimension of this syndrome, mainly focusing rather on higher order cognitive functions like the executive function, working memory, theory of mind, language, and the like. An alternative, how should I put it, complementary at the very least uh, view posits that schizophrenia, but not only schizophrenia, is a self-disorder characterized by anomalous self-experience and awareness. So if we approach psychosis not only or at the very least not exclusively <coughs> from the point of view of the, the explanation that translates this condition into a uh, alteration of the normal equilibrium uh, of uh, a mixture of neurotransmitters with their interaction with their receptors, but there's clearly more than that. I mean, uh, this condition has a multidimensionality that cannot be entirely reduced to uh, a business of uh, altered neurotransmission, although there is also that aspect and we better uh, investigate it and we better produce uh, drugs that uh, can uh, in some way uh, uh, in trial in, with the trial and error approach uh, ameliorate uh, the psychological and mental condition of these patients. Um, so let me try, let me start with a, a colleague, a friend of mine, uh, Thomas Fuchs, who is Carl Jasper Professor of uh, Psychiatry at the University of Heidelberg. This is a quote from uh, um, a, a publication of 2005. Schizophrenic patient does not inhabit her body anymore in the sense of using as taken for granted its implicit structure as a medium for relating to the world. So this is, is crucial because uh, uh, the body by Thomas Fuchs is interpreted, is considered, is explained as a uh, uh, a structure that is the main medium to relate to the world and, uh, of course, the, the most important part of the world for us humans are others, others other individuals. So I want to read a, a brief quote from uh, a report of one of Thomas' patients who, in remission, in a remission phase, was remembering uh, and uh, uh, narrating how her relationship with her body changed and how in parallel changed the way she related to the world of others. It's a 20 year old female patient. There are also gender related issues that should be very carefully examined and discussed in this piece of prose, but I'm not qualified to do that. And besides that, I, I wouldn't have time, I'm happy if you uh, uh, want to discuss those aspects uh, in question and, and answer time. For some time, I had a feeling as if my clothes did not seem appropriate anymore. My gait had changed. I walked stiffly and did not know how to hold my hands. Then I often looked into the mirror and found that my facial expression had changed. And I began to think that I might be regarded as a prostitute. Men looked so strange at me. I took passport pictures of myself in order to examine whether I only imagined that. Then I began to feel a kind of charging or tension in my body when others came near to me, as if it were passing over from them. Finally, I thought I should be made a prostitute by brain manipulation. So here we have a diachronic progression of uh, a patient speaking first about the relationship with her own body, then with the body of others, and finally, at the end, comes uh, 
uh, so to speak, the pathological deus ex machina, the explanatory framework uh, of the delusional thought that someone uh, externally influenced uh, her mind, uh, turning her uh, into a prostitute. So to use um, an old uh, psychopathological uh, uh, jargon, here we see uh, a transition from the implicit to the explicit, but the roots of what we uh, 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 consider and uh, characterize as delusional thought, delusional ideas, uh, as its roots in a bodily condition which uh, uh, emerges uh, pretty earlier on. So I, I will talk uh, about schizophrenia from the vantage point uh, of, uh, of the body. Because my personal research agenda is specifically what you see translated into this image. Finding the body in the brain, which means uh, uh, not just the truism that the brain is a part of the body, we all know that, uh, but it means that uh, it's hard to believe that we can ever come up uh, with, uh, I wouldn't say an explanation, but let's say, let's be happy to say a better understanding of how the brain works if we sever the brain from the body. That's what I mean by finding the body in the brain. And indeed, I always refer to the brain hyphen body as a unit, okay? So I'm certainly not a fan of the brain in a vat thought experiments. Here a philosopher, Sean Gallagher, who wrote, even if all the unessential features of the self are stripped away, there is a basic, immediate, or primitive something that we are willing to call a self. And uh, the way I interpret this minimal or core aspect, the self is a kind of uh, 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 multi-layered uh, solid, and we attribute name and features to all these different solids uh, until we reach uh, uh, um, an inner core of uh, relational uh, uh, flesh, <laughs> share, okay? But one of the distinctive feature of this bodily nature of ours is that uh, this body has potentialities for action. So this body, as Merleau-Ponty would have put it, incarnate uh, a particular way of uh, relating slash knowing the world that he called practognosia. So a pragmatic knowledge which doesn't require words to be experienced, although it can be translated in words, and with the word translation, uh, big truck balls are <laughs> ahead. So there is a sense of body that is inactive in nature, and that enables to capture the most primitive sense of self. The body is primarily given to us as a source or a power of action. One of the few things I have clear in mind after 40 years of dealing with the brain is that the motor system can be activated without producing any movement, but this motor activity in your still brain plays a major role in perception and cognition. This is one of the few clear ideas uh, I, um, I, I could s subscribe uh, without any doubt. Don't ask me about emotions because it's completely more confused picture, but that's for another day, okay? so. These motor potentialities, which are mapped at the level of the sensory motor system, are crucial because, in a way, they provide the constraints for the building of our experience of our relation uh, um, to the world. And the basic sense of self we are dealing with is supposedly, therefore, antecedent the distinction between sense of agency, I am the author of my actions, and sense of body ownership, this forearm is mine, belongs to me. And it provides also a conceptual framework for a coherent interpretation of a variety of behavioral and psychopathological data that we will see in a minute. I want to stress once more uh, that the motor aspects of the bodily self provide the means to integrate self-related multimodal sensor information about the body and the world the body interacts with. So as I see the motor uh, 
part of our brain. The motor system is uh, playing a key role in providing the binding, the experiential glue to uh, integrate all the multiple sensory inputs uh, uh, that we derive from specialized cells, transducers, uh, 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 variously localized at the periphery of our, of our body. Once we go beyond that level, it's all electricity. We should always be aware that we are dealing with bloody spikes, uh, okay, which have no particular thought, color, intention, desire, or feeling. We are dealing with electricity. It's sad, but it's true. Huh? We, we, we work like that, sadly enough. Okay, so one way to look at our openness to the world, our uh, implicit, uh, uh, more or less defined possibility to entertain relations that generate experience uh, um, as a fourth motor connotation. And these motor potentialities, therefore, are highly relevant to explain the most implicit level of description of the self and uh, many people, not just 100 years ago, uh, much more recently, uh, I name a few here, uh, um, particularly uh, Joseph Parnas uh, in Copenhagen, but also uh, 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 Louis Sass, uh, who lives in Brooklyn and teaches at Rutgers, uh, and uh, philosophers like Sean Gallagher, but particularly Z Dan Zahavi, Zahavi and uh, a philosopher and Parnas, a psychiatry, co-founded the Center for the Research of Subjectivity uh, in, in Copenhagen, which is very active in this type of, uh, of um, empirical and theoretical research. So the schizophrenic spectrum, because we are dealing with the spectrum, has been described as a psychiatric condition associated with disorders that affect the functionality of a minimal or core self that um, Parnas described as ipsity and that I designate as the bodily self. So let's focus of, on this first pre-reflective level of self-knowledge, implicit awareness that this is my experience, that the experience I have of the world belongs to me. Uh, ipsity, uh, as uh, um, Parnas describes it. This ipsity can be described at different levels uh, uh, in terms of uh, minus of experience, uh, of corporeality, stream of consciousness, self-demarcation, existential orientation. I will focus on corporeality, and in particular with the different way we have um, of dealing with our own body. And I will refer to an experiment uh, that we were able to do on schizophrenic patients being inspired by a dear friend and colleague that tragically a few weeks ago uh, passed away uh, in Italy, Francesca Frassinetti, um, a clinical neuropsychologist uh, and uh, um, a neurologist uh, who first discovered in uh, right uh, side brain damage patients uh, the lack of something that transpires in healthy control, an implicit advantage in processing uh, uh, body parts that belong to yourself uh, without being asked uh, if what you are perceptually processing uh, is part of your body. Because uh, you see your hands, the hand of a stranger, but the question is not tell me if this is your hand or the, the hand of someone else, but tell me if this hand matches uh, with the hand uh, um, that we employ as a target, like here, here you have the foot. This is an experiment that we run uh, on schizophrenic patients. Uh, uh, the first experiment to the left is a simple matching to sample task. So there is a foot at the center. The task is to tell whether uh, it is identical to the one shown above or the one shown below. Unknowingly to the participants of the experiment, uh, half of the uh, feet, of the hands, of the shoes, or, or of the mobile phones belong to them. We photographed them two weeks before. We, we asked them to show up with a, um, a fake justification to get anagraphical data, and we asked them uh, 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 to be allowed to take pictures of their body part for the next experiment. So they come back, they do this experiment, it's a visual or matching to sample task, 
Then they perform a second experiment in which there is no more a target image at the center. The question is, please tell me which of the two shoes, mobile phones, hands or feet are yours, okay? So the stimuli are the same, the questions are different. To the left, there is a matching to sample which doesn't have any relevance to the mindness uh, of the objects uh, I am asked to judge. Uh, in the second experiment, there is an explicit request to recognize which is which. Is it clear enough? If you have a question, please stop me. So here are the results. Uh, the controls are in gray bars, the patients in black. We see the normal uh, and expected uh, uh, higher accuracy in controlled people to respond to the first experiment when they are processing their own hand or foot, but there is a, a similar performance uh, uh, when this is carried out on inanimate object. But this advantage, this better accuracy in reacting to a part of your body is totally absent from the schizophrenic patients, and we are sure that their performance cannot be in any meaningful way related uh, uh, to the pharmacotherapy uh, they were undergoing because we calculated the chloropromazine equivalence. Uh, I mean, control boring stuff that you can find in the paper without boring you with these uh, details. So we are sure that this is genuinely portraying their condition and it is not generated by the uh, uh, drugs they were taking. But when you ask explicitly, please tell me whether this is your, uh, which is your, is your foot or your hand, we are very poor in that uh, kind of performance and similarly poor are the schizophrenic patients. What is different is the type of error they commit. They uh, tend to recognize uh, as their hand and their foot uh, those body parts that belong to others. In healthy controls, the results are more balanced. So why this dissociation? Our hypothesis is that in the first task, uh, you evoke an implicit knowledge about the motor potentialities of your body that gives you the advantage uh, in uh, responding more accurately and, more fa and faster when you are looking at one of your body parts with respect to someone else. While when I ask you, please tell me which is your hand, uh, you um, are supposed to match this poorly rendered uh, iconic image uh, of one of your body parts with your iconic memory of that body part. And our memory about ourselves uh, is notoriously and probably for good reasons, very poor. <laughs> so, schizophrenic patients do not show the self-advantage. Similar to controls, they do not show the self-advantage when explicitly asked. So they have problems, this is our explanation, in activating a motor representation of their own body parts when looking at them. And such a deficit shows the relevance of implicit motor representation of the body for a coherent sense of body itself. But we are more convinced of this hypothesis after this second experiment in, in which we presented right or left hand, 50% of the stimuli belong to the participants, the remaining 50% to strangers. They could appear one at a time, variously oriented. The task was simply, please tell me if what you're looking at is the right or the left hand. So the more it is rotated from the canonical perspective in which you look at your hand, where the right hand has the thumb to the left, and the left, the thumb, is to the right, it's much easier and faster to tell whether you're looking at the right or the left hand uh, if it is like this rather than it is rotated like that. And indeed, healthy controls, tons of experiments show that the more you need to mentally rotate uh, the hand, uh, the more it takes, uh, it takes you to give uh, the answer. The important aspect here is that, again, we see an advantage People are faster when they rotate their dominant hand with respect to when they rotate the left hand or the hands of a stranger. Schizophrenic patients, no, they don't. And there's more than that. When we do this task, uh, 
we, we did an fMRI experiment on LT controls. When you are required to solve this very easy problem, whether what you're looking at is the right hand or a left hand, but again, 50% is your right or left hand, 50% belongs to others. Um, what we see in the brain is a series of brain circuits that uh, are more active when you are processing a part of your own body, be it the right hand or the left hand, with respect to when you uh, uh, do the same uh, for the body parts of others. But when you look at your dominant hand, all the mm, participants were right-handed, you see an activation of the contralateral ventral premotor cortex. So a part of the brain that uh, is, uh, together with other circuits, in charge of controlling uh, um, your use in the world of the very same hand. And another aspect of corporeality of the bodily self, uh, which is related to the motor system as a in multisensory integrator, is peripersonal space. Peripersonal space is the space that you can reach by stretching out your arm. We know from a variety of sources, both from the animal model as uh, uh, from uh, clinical neuropsychology, that the brain treats uh, and maps peripersonal space differently from the way it treats the space beyond our reach, that we call external space or far uh, space. With this experiment, we were able to uh, demonstrate in a first uh, a paper that uh, this peripersonal space can be extended, can grow bigger, if you perform a very simple exercise, moving this uh, wood block from one side to the other for 10 minutes using a gripper. So the gripper becomes a, a pr hand prosthesis, which enables you to reach a space that normally would be not peripersonal, but becomes peripersonal through the use of this uh, uh, extension. And so it expands. What happens in schizophrenic patient is that their, sorry, their peripersonal space is narrower when compared to that of healthy control, but it can enlarge through motor use. And we, we, um, we suspect that this could be very interesting uh, uh, for uh, approaches that deal with this basic, very basic aspect uh, of uh, the relationship the patient has uh, uh, to uh, herself or himself uh, by means of sensory increasing, uh, uh, um, exploiting, leveraging on the plasticity of the sensory motor system. Uh, in, in my opinion, this would candidate for an interesting uh, 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 trial uh, in a numerosity of patients, bigger than the 25 or 26 that we were able to, to study. Let me quickly move uh, to the social dimension of psychosis, and I like to do it with this gif uh, from uh, one of my favorite uh, movies of uh, Roman Polaski. I think it's his second movie shot in London, uh, uh, Repulsion, which portrays uh, the onset, the development, and the epilogue of a psychotic crisis wonderfully uh, uh, impersonated, uh, uh, um, acted by a very young uh, Catherine Deneuve. And this image uh, portrays one of the um, assur al hallucinatory vision uh, uh, she experienced when, while she uh, walking down the corridor uh, of, her, of her place. And again, here I think uh, uh, we should uh, uh, relate to the contribution of uh, uh, the good old psychopathology, specifically here with the Jan Minkowski, uh, who was strongly influenced both by Husserl and by Bergson. The core problem of schizophrenics is their lack of vital contact with reality. There is a Bergsonian echo uh, in this expression, viewed as an incapacity to resonate with the world, to establish meaningful bonds with other individuals. So this is a core dimension of psychosis, not only uh, uh, for uh, um, Minkowski, but also, um, sorry. It's, it's sensible, only, it's peculiar, this guy. 
Okay. Uh, more recently, another German psychopathologist who wrote an incredibly interesting uh, uh, a book on schizophrenia, The Loss of Natural Evidence, uh, the autistic dimension of schizophrenia interpreted as a global crisis of common sense, which means the incapacity, again, to pre-reflexively grasp the meaning of the world. Loss of the natural evidence, in particular, of the world of others. Okay? And um, recently, with uh, Francesca Ferroni, uh, a former PhD student of mine, we wrote this chapter in the um, handbook uh, uh, of uh, body awareness. The basic experience we entertain of ourselves as bodily self is from the very beginning driven by our interaction uh, with the other bodies. So the intercorporeal aspect uh, of intersubjectivity becomes crucial also to understand uh, what's going on in schizophrenia. This is one experiment we published years ago uh, with the Clinic of Psychiatry of the University of Parma. We were recording uh, the, the EMG, um, the electromyography from the facial muscles of healthy controls and patients while they were looking and listening to short video clips where two actors were either laughing, crying, or performing meaningless uh, 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 movement of the face emitting sounds uh, devoid of any emotional content. And to squeeze it in a nutshell, if you record, for example, from the zygomaticus major, a muscle that normally contracts when we express positive emotions, um, in red you see the controls. They activate the muscle when they watch laughter, but it is actually inhibited when they watch uh, um, cry, and it's not activated at all during the observation of the meaningless grimaces. We suggest that this facial mimicry is not happening at random, but is particularly triggered when we are engaged uh, in an emotional dyadic uh, exchange. The, the qualification of emotional uh, clearly makes a huge difference. But look what happens uh, with laughter uh, with the zygomaticus of schizophrenic patient. It's mostly flat, however, it is uh, abnormally activated when it should sit silent, namely <coughs> when the patient is witnessing someone crying, okay? So exactly the opposite. And if we divide the patients in those that activate less uh, the facial muscles uh, uh, in, in response to others' emotion, we see they are also worse uh, in identifying uh, uh, the, the valence of the expression, identifying laughter as uh, positive and uh, cry as negative. The less they activate the muscle, the poorer the performance in this. Quickly, another study where we were interested to investigate the relationship between an action being performed by someone facing us and the emotion possibly expressed by the very same agent. So, it's very complicated, but I, I want to make it short and simple. So in one situation, they saw an actor performing uh, an action like grasping uh, a handphone, a bottle, uh, or a glass uh, with a neutral expression, or in other cases, angry or happy. But the kinematic was the same. We only cut the head and digitally transplanted uh, a, a, a happy or an angry face because we want to keep the kinematic of the movement constant, to make a long story short, observation of emotionally neutral action evoked a reduced activation in the frontoparietal circuit uh, that we call expressing the mirror mechanism that normally kicks in when you, we are watching someone acting um, in front of us. But what is most interesting, and this is uh, clearly I think the most original part of this research is the attempt to correlate the response at the behavioral level, at the electrophysiological level, or at the brain level with the experience, with the phenomenality of the patient. How do we study the phenomenality of the patient? By using the scale, uh, the bone scale of, of basic symptoms, uh, or SPI in its shorter version, which has been uh, uh, um, 
not invented, created uh, uh, by uh, a German psychiatrist, uh, Huber, and continued by the school of Köln, uh, by Klosterkötter and, uh, and other pupils of that school. And it enables you to study the first person experience of the patient in relation of a variety of elements which include uh, those that we have uh, uh, designated as bodily self. So what we see is that the activation of the left inferior parietal lobe of the parietal part of this uh, mirroring network correlates negatively the activation with the symptoms as measured uh, by uh, the bone scale. You see? The stronger the symptoms of the SPI, the less the activation of this uh, part uh, of the circuit that normally respond uh, to the action of others. When we focus on the emotional quality of the action, the observation of an action performed by an angry agent produced reduce, uh, reduced activation of the right anterior insula, which is a deep uh, region in our brain that, uh, to put it very crudely, somehow is capable of connecting what's going on inside of our body, what we call interoception, to what's going on outside, that you may call extraception, in a very loose and crude way. So the anterior insula of the patients was less active uh, uh, than in healthy controls uh, when what was uh, at stake was the action of an angry agent uh, and uh, also negatively correlating with the empathic quotient of the very same patient. So the lowest the score in the empathic quotient, the less the activation of the parietal pole of this mirroring uh, circuit. So I think that when we deal with identity, self, subjectivity, we must keep together two dimensions, similarity and otherness. Similarity and uh, otherness, uh, so the alter, uh, the other inside each of us must be uh, balanced and coexist. Because if one of the two is lacking and completely overtaken by the other, we enter either into a dimension of autistic separation, l'autisme pauvre uh, of what uh, Eugène Minkowski was uh, speaking about, but also Bloiler was speaking uh, uh, in terms of autism uh, when referring to, and Freud had a completely different view, a push on Jung to convince Bloiler to, to steer towards a more sexually oriented version of the notion of, of autism. Uh, or, on the other end of the spectrum, the patient uh, uh, can uh, experience uh, a total symbiotic fusion with the other. The other literally is devouring the patient, trying to englobe it. And quite often, the patient oscillates in different stages uh, uh, of the disease, disease, whatever. Uh, so these are the two split extremes referred to when describing schizophrenic uh, 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 psychosis. And with this fMRI study, we demonstrated that uh, one part of the brain that is normally activated when my body is touched, the posterior part of the insula, which is a hot part of the brain for uh, uh, particularly for uh, uh, pleasant touch, uh, touch uh, uh, that is executed uh, um, with a certain speed, uh, with a certain frequency, which is normally uh, uh, goes on in prosocial interactions with others. It maps into the posterior insula. When the hand of uh, our participants was touched, uh, this part of the brain is activated. When they were watching the hand of someone else, particularly when caressed or slapped, uh, in healthy controls, uh, the activation in posterior insula is suppressed. This doesn't happen in schizophrenic patients. And actually, two of the patients had to be pulled out from the scanner because as soon as they were watching these video clips uh, in which they saw the hand of someone being caressed or hit by a stranger, they saw themselves uh, in that image. And that generated a, a, an um, anxious crisis, uh, and they had to be uh, retrieved, pulled out of the scanner. So, 
I think this is in important because the borders of the bodily cells appear to be blurred in schizophrenic patients. And for sake of concision, what I didn't mention, is here we are dealing with first episode, psychotic patient, six months after the first episode. Later on diagnosed as schizophrenic, but very young in terms of psychopharmacological treatment. So we decided to start with first episode because looking for a more pristine, so, so to speak, uh, uh, state of their brain because the impact of uh, the um, pharmacological uh, uh, therapeutic intervention was at its early stages uh, and with a mono, uh, mono drug uh, therapy. So the lack of a self other differentiation in the domain of affective tactile experiences uh, is epitomized by the lack of the activation. But when they look at the hand of someone else being uh, activated, in healthy controls, the anterior insula is deactivated, but uh, the premotor cortex, where touch, vision, and audition around the body are integrated on, by motor neurons. So we are not dealing with mirror neurons here. We are dealing with the equivalent of what we call area F4 is less active in schizophrenic patient, in first episode schizophrenic patient, than in healthy control. And again, we have uh, a significant correlation with their own psychotic uh, experience as measured by uh, the scale of uh, uh, the basic symptoms of Vaughan. So reduced activation in premotor multimodal integrations regions like the right inferior frontal gyrus and the premotor cortex and consistent correlations between bold response, the activation of the brain, and basic symptoms could reflect, this is our hypothesis, the neural basis of a reduced sense of a coherent bodily self in schizophrenia. So the dimension of otherness is connected to sensory motor differentiation processes of self from other. The combination of these two mechanisms of similarity and differentiation means that, for example, to empathize is not dissolving oneself within another, but recognizing another as someone similar to ourself who is, however, alien, not us, other. And the last boring experimental results I, I will discuss and then I'm done. So we had two spots in the brain of first episode schizophrenic patient that, pass me the expression, behave differently with respect to the equivalent part of the brains of the healthy controls, the ventral premotor cortex and the posterior insula. So we decided to study the functional connectivity of these two hot spots in healthy controls and in schizophrenic patients. And we did this experiment in collaboration with a, a colleague I, I, um, I really admire, a psychiatrist, a philosopher, a psychoanalyst, Professor Georg Nortov, who is at Quebec University in Canada, but he's German. Um, so we've, we zoomed on the functional connectivity of these two spots, uh, and we correlated uh, uh, the outcome of this functional connectivity analysis, again, with the phenomenal experience of the psychotic uh, uh, patients. And we found that there was an increase, an abnormal increase, between a lateral and a mesial part of the brain of schizophrenic, pa uh, schizophrenic patients. The ventral premotor cortex, which is part of the mirror circuit, and the posterior cingulate cortex that is variously rubricated into the so-called default mode network. If you ask me what the default mode network is there for, my answer is I, I wouldn't possibly know. <laughs> it's involved in a variety. I have a very confused idea about the default mode network. Certainly it's not a deus ex machina that will explain everything. But it seems reasonable to suppose that the posterior cingulate cortex as part of this part of uh, the mesial aspect uh, of the brain is among other things, okay, allow me to say this, related to an inner dimension of the self, autobiographical memory, someone is calling our name, we concentrate on something which is really personal, then 
you see that part of the brain popping out. And it's interesting that this abnormal connection between a system we normally employ to map what's going on, going on out there in the social domain and something that deals more predominantly with just with the inner self of myself are abnormally connected. And the more they are abnormally connected, the most severe are the symptoms as evaluated by the scale. It tells us something. On the other hand, the posterior insula and the posterior cingulate cortex, the connectivity between the two is decreased, is less in the patient with respect to the healthy control. And considering the sensory affective function of the posterior insula, I was mentioning before, and the postcentral gyrus, S1, the, the primary somatosensory area, the part of the brain that maps our tactile sensation, the results might underpin, this is the way uh, we interpreted it, uh, again, together with uh, Georg Norfolk, as uh, deficits in the processing of bodily sensory affective information as belonging to the self, which is one of the crucial psychopathological problems of schizophrenia. Okay, so, to wrap it up, the human body plays a constitutive role in foundational aspect of social cognition. Second, this is sounds rather radical, but I think when you need to be radical, you have to be radical. <laughs> the body is the a priori, non further reducible condition of possibility of experience, and intercorporeality is not the whole thing, it's not the whole story, but definitely is the ground level of intersubjectivity. We cannot pretend it doesn't exist, we must study it. Our personal, I, let me be crude, fine, I, I will finish being re very crude. Our personal identity amounts to a series of basic modalities of openness to the world characterized by a finite set of desires and behaviors and of the variously consciously experienced feelings they generate. Sensory motor and affective bodily states and their underpinning neural mechanism not only provide the architecture enabling the making of any historical self, but also enable the identity externalization which characterizes the creation of cultural artifacts and the impersonation of fictional characters. But that's another story. Cognitive neuroscience can today address classic topics of psychopathology with a new level of description, finally enabling the correlation between the first person experiential aspects of psychiatric diseases and their neurobiological roots. I, I hope you, you will have noticed that I never used a causal language. This state of the brain causes, we are happy to find specific meaningful correlation, and this specific meaningful correlation are, should be the starting point for further investigation. Brain function anomalies of multisensory integration Differential processing of self and other related bodily information mediating self-experience, which is uh, what I show you in the second part of my talk, might be at the basis of the imbalance in the pre-reflective relationship of the embodied self to the social world observed in schizophrenia. Sorry for being long, but a TED talk uh, wouldn't have worked. Um, thank you, Victoria, Vittorio, for that remarkable talk, which, you know, characteristically combines very large claims about um, our behavior in the world and our relations with others with these specific experiments. I didn't know of these experiments, which most of these experiments which you've done relating to schizophrenia. So we have the large-scale vision and the small-scale experiments. I have no doubt that there are plenty of people out there who object both to the large-scale vision and to the small, or will criticize the small-scale experiments. I mean, I think it's interesting that you point out that um, these are aspects, this first-person level is an aspect of schizophrenia which has been rather neglected in fa favor of the study of higher cognitive. By all means. And I wonder why 
why, why this is the case. I mean, the way you present it seems to me rather obvious. I'm not a specialist. I'm going to open it to the specialists in a moment. Oh, okay, so we've got somebody right here who wants to take the discussion. Go ahead. Ich und du. I am thou. Okay. Okay. <laughs> so, so I'm assuming in your connection with this liner, you, you, you spoke of Buber since Buber was his main mentor for many years after he visited yeah. Jung. Um, the other thing I just wanted to know, one or two things, uh, names. Do you ever see yourself as somewhat a descendant of the work of Walter Buchanan? Because he, like you, focused on Thank you. So uh, first, let me answer uh, uh, David's uh, um, uh, question. Why is it so? Well, uh, if you ask me, uh, I would see it as uh, one of the many aspects of the large predominance uh, of the classic cognitivist approach to the relationship between the brain and the mind, okay? Uh, which um, experience different seasons, partly with different languages, uh, we, we heard a lot about uh, information processing. Now we hear a lot about predicting coding. But basically, what is constantly overemphasized, if you ask me, too much overemphasized, is uh, precisely the, the algorithmic, the, the computational uh, uh, aspect of how the brain works and how the brain maps uh, or whatever it does, because we, we, we are discussing a lot about which is the verb that best designates what the brain does. Maps represent, uh, uh, enact. Uh, uh, there's a, a whole uh, industry of different recipes to this question. But uh, nevertheless, uh, coming to your point, uh, the freezing uh, is incredibly relevant because now we are discovering that the autonomic system is not autonomous at all, for example, is fully integrated uh, uh, with the system, uh, 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 with the neocortex, uh, let alone uh, uh, with, the, um, with the brainstem, of course, but also with the immune system, uh, with the mediators of inflammation. So uh, a release uh, 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 starts of a chronic inhibition for the prefrontal cortex to the amygdala. The amygdala uh, releases uh, the vagal break. This is Steve Porges. Uh, so perhaps you may say too mechanistic, okay, but it captures uh, one aspect uh, of how the system deals with stress, uh, with, uh, with fear, and freezing is the most primitive response in terms of evolution, is the crude predominance of the unmyelinated vagus system, which uh, reduces as much as possible the metabolic level, uh, heart frequency, and you're almost paralyzed. You pretend uh, to be dead and you, you hope the other is going to buy it. Schizophrenia <laughs> could be understood as an extended pretending to be dead. Well, in some cases and in some stages. Yeah. Yeah. But you see also very different uh, manifestations. Yeah. Okay. Any? Well, good. Go ahead. Yes. Slightly between brainlessness and mindlessness. And in another 
sense, you could say that the, the data of psychoanalysis in this case Virginia is handled by a psychoanalytic Christian school in the United States running the asylum using a very sophisticated but very metapsychological experience distant model of the mind to explain an, in, an interpersonally sometimes pure, heroically uh, schizophrenia. And then you have the, the collapse yeah. of that model, the rise of biomedical psychiatry, which has now created, again, a very thin subjective. I'm thinking about also Sullivan. Sullivan, uh, yeah, yeah. if you read Sullivan uh, today, uh, sounds in many aspects pretty modern yeah. and more advanced than our um, cocktail to be re-equilibrated yeah. uh, version of the disease. Yeah, but in either case, phenomenology was, was sort of left a little bit. You know, yeah, like yeah, you know, but it's a minority. I, if you ask, uh, uh, even in Italy or in Germany, um, I spoke about that many times uh, with, with colleagues uh, who are into psychopathology. The, the vast majority of psychiatric interns never heard about uh, Minkowski or Binswanger. That tradition is almost gone uh, for the moment. It's a kind of pendulum, as you said. So when our dissatisfaction with the status quo, which is growing uh, also in quarters of psychiatry that you wouldn't uh, rubricate in this field, or rather very far away from that, this total insatisfaction, I hope in the long run, will, will uh, push people to, to look also to some of the dimension I was trying to illustrate tonight. Could you speak up? Oh, good. Thank you. Can you talk about the role of delusions or dense? Sorry, I, I can't hear you. Can you talk about the role of delusions or dense therapy in treatment of narcissistic Yeah. I, I have Could you know, repeat the question uh, before yeah, uh, uh, The question relates with uh, dance or art therapy in relation to schizophrenia and movement therapy. And movement therapy. Okay. Um, I'm not an expert of that, so I, I pro and I'm not a psychiatrist. Uh, but uh, I've been involved since a few years in an experimentation which, uh, being a longitudinal study, is really difficult to be, to be performed because we, we, so far we experienced many dropout. And um, it is a therapeutic intervention that this colleague of mine, a psychiatrist and psychoanalyst, a pupil of uh, Gaetano Benedetti, an Italian psychiatrist who came to the United States because of his Jewish origin during the war. I think he was a pupil of Silvano Arieti here. Then he moved back to Switzerland and is one of the most, uh, among the psychoanalysts, uh, among those who focus almost entirely all of his career dealing with psychosis. So briefly, um, uh, Pechicha, Maurizio Pechicha, the colleague uh, who uh, 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 uses this uh, approach, uh, call it amniotic therapy. I don't like the term because I think it's in many ways can be misleading. But basically, it's a bodily intervention where the patient uh, is uh, immersed in uh, water with the same temperature of the body, and the operator very gently moves it in the water, uh, so they synchronize their movement, uh, uh, and simultaneously they are video recorded. Afterwards, there is a group session in which all the patients and the therapists discuss their reaction as seen from the, the video footage. And um, we had uh, a few very interesting uh, positive cases of uh, uh, patients who were totally cut out and they had a sudden shift uh, from negative to prevailing positive symptoms and the prevailing positive, positive symptoms, once reduced and treated, uh, started uh, uh, a cycle of openness and of uh, therapeutic efficacy, but it's two patients. Uh, we started with 20, so forget about that. <laughs> it, it's work in progress, but uh, we, we, um, uh, with our group, we cannot get the numerosity that would be required to test properly. But this is one, certainly, one way to go, one way to tap. Uh, on the bodily self uh, that um, I would bet uh, in, in some cases can, can have beneficial effect. It is definitely worth being investigated. Do we have any other questions? Well, I'm going to ask you a rather 
technical question, okay. which would I'll see if I can, <coughs> if we can translate it for those of you who haven't read quite as much of Vittoria as I have. I think one of the interesting things about this presentation was your identification, as it were, of the failure of traditional mirror areas, inferior, fri uh, um, in inferior parietal lobule, yeah. inferior frontal gyrus. Reduce activation. Re reduce with activation. In all, and also this, active, this reduced activation of right anterior insula, which is, all, as we all know, quite involved in yeah. interoception. So on the one hand, you have this, yeah. which suggests a diminution of activity in traditional, like what we are can now call traditional mirror okay. areas. On yeah. the other hand, at the end, you point to this really interesting thing that the sort of champion mirror area, which is uh, in, uh, ventral premotor cortex, um, that has a higher has a high link to yeah. with that area of traditionally associated with the emotion, uh, emotional um, responses. So this yeah. is the posterior cingulate cortex. Right. So this sort of points to a way, which is perhaps a bit related to your question, the question about dance. Yeah. What, do, do any therapeutic possibilities spring out of that? Yeah, in principle, for example, also with um, working on the expansion of the peripersonal space, uh, and that can be done uh, in a variety of ways, including uh, the use, for example, of virtual reality, uh, which can be very handy and uh, uh, easier to be implemented with the low budget that our government uh, uh, um, invest in, into this enormous crisis of our societies. The, the crisis of mental health is not uh, enough being taken into consideration in, in all the countries, uh, in the United States, in Italy, in Germany, in France, in the UK, wherever you go, you, you can feel, you can touch it by merely walking in the street, okay? So yes, um, I see the possibility to develop, uh, at the very least, uh, to come up with some serious, in terms of numbers of numerosity, clinical experimentation to test whether this is a viable way to go, uh, to side the traditional and sometimes disappointing pharmacological treatment. Yeah. That, let me add to this, for negative symptoms, practically work very poorly. We can sedate uh, the delusion, the, the, uh, the anxiety, we can greatly reduce the, the lively relations of the patient with the world, kind of dampen it down with uh, obvious negative uh, consequences, but to certain symptoms, uh, uh, I mean, what, what we can do is very little, so at the very least, it will be worth giving it a try. That's I mean, I think the interesting thing about this presentation is precisely the um, issue of the re-engagement of the self with the outside, yeah. the other. I mean, we all know that. I'm, I'm not a psychiatrist, but I mean, you know, this is a fundamental issue, and it does suggest that enhancement of imitative responses such would be allowed by um, the mirror systems would somehow improve yeah, I mean that covers only one aspect. Yeah. I, I, I will never, I will never subscribe the idea. Uh, don't, don't go, um, don't go home uh, with the idea that what I said is that schizophrenia is broken mirror neurons. <laughs> That's not absolutely. I, I think that um, since we are well, my question was social you, yeah. creatures, it's obvious that. Uh, this kind of mechanism are, are, are involved uh, um, in any case. And they can be involved in terms of a reduction, as I show you here, but on the other hand, in terms of hyperconnectivity. So the picture is very complex. Yeah. Okay. No, I have no doubt about this, but I mean, my, my question is not thinking in terms of broken mirror systems, okay. but taking note of the fact that these are locations yeah. in which you know, we have mirror operativity yeah. at the high. And so it may be a matter of enhancement as much as anything uh, it, else. Uh, we, we briefly mentioned uh, uh, on autism. Autism, I've, I've been involved in research uh, in relation to children autism for a while. Then I stopped. Uh, it's a very complex area, uh, very complicated under many points of view. But in my experience, I've seen different approaches, different therapeutic approaches, 
in, in my limited experience, the approach that I saw better functioning, particularly for the more autistic among the autistic individual, uh, uh, so those that are not able to speak, that never develop language, is an intervention at the, uh, at the level of psychomotricity. Psychomotricity. So, body movement, basically. Yeah. Imitation games, uh, contextualization, metaphorical translation of content by means of the body, those, those sort of things. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. In the, autism, I'm wondering actually, are you interested in exploring that that notion, that the, that aspect of the uh, affectivity of, in schizophrenia? That was not my uh, original research. It was a research done by a, a former PhD student of mine, Magali Rocha, and um, Daniel Stern. We we were very good friends. Uh, was invited to to come to Parma. He gave a talk. Uh, which raised immediately the interest uh, of people uh, in our group, notably Giacomo Rizzolatti and Magali Rocha. And they did this uh, fMRI study showing that uh, uh, when you uh, must decide whether someone is behaving in a rude or in a gentle way, one region of the insula kicks in. And at the behavioral level, Autistic individual, I think they were adolescents, uh, all high functioning with years of rehabilitation behind, uh, had no problem in identifying the goal of an action, but had much more trouble in determining whether that action was performed in a gentle or in a crude way. So they were not so as good as uh, uh, the uh, uh, the control population in uh, uh, assigning an emotional an emotional prosody to the gesture. Mm. Interesting. Thank you. Good. Well, unless any other... Oh, Andreas, yes. Uh, yeah, okay. so one question. Um, I mean, we can hear. We're talking about bodies and body oh, yeah. Yeah. Do your research also go as far as erotic or sexual? <laughs> <laughs> sudden burst of laughter, if there is any psychoanalyst in the room, <laughs> uh, <laughs> might be interesting <laughs> to hear about it. No, I laughed because uh, I think um, cognitive social neuroscience in general, most of the time, is very sanitized. Uh, in our paper in 2007, Motion, Emotion and Empathy uh, um, in Aesthetic Experience, uh, we quoted uh, an fMRI study where um, people who saw penis in erection uh, activated uh, the motor representation of their dominant hand. <laughs> and uh, this activation, I think, was gender specific. It's not our stuff, <laughs> it's in the literature. And um, gender, uh, I, I don't know, forget about it. Um, <laughs> Whatever. So there were differences uh, among participants in terms of the activation of uh, 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 the motor simulation in, re in relation to the sexual organ they were looking at. But uh, I'm not an expert in the field, and I'm afraid there's very little. That's why I say it, it's sanitized. Uh, I, I wouldn't know, probably is a reaction. I mean, on the one hand, you have the cognitive revolution, so everything is language, computation, information processing. And it's hard to side information processing with sex. If you do it, probably you have problems, I think. <laughs> and on the one hand, on the, on the other hand, uh, uh, even if you are more open to uh, an embodied cognition uh, uh, take, uh, on the mind of the psyche or, or the self or subjectivity, sex is always uh, in the background at best or out of the picture. I, I don't know why I think we need uh, psychoanalysis to explain that, but it's true. Good. Well, thank you all very much. Let's thank you. Thank you.
please, please come down and join us all for a drink, and you could ask more informal questions of Victoria. <laughs>